Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of these sort of clickbait titles, hasn't it? Seven signs of this, six signs of that. Um, this, this is not really a solution. I'm not going to tell you, do these seven things and then you're agile. That would be wrong. It just doesn't work that way. What this is about is kind of giving you signals, giving you signs that you are on the right path already. Because agility is not about tools. It's not about methods. It's not about the things that consulting firms sell you. It's about the behavior and the culture of your organization. I love the previous talks. Did you guys love those talks? Weren't they awesome? Very concrete stuff, right? I love them. It's, it's almost like we planned this because it worked really awesome. I love the narrative here. Very specific, very tangible things you can do. But unless you have the agility around the organization, if the organization itself is not agile, a lot of these things are going to be really hard to do. So what I'm going to talk about today are things that go up a couple of levels. A lot of, a lot of C level people in this house. I don't know. Maybe not. That's OK, because you guys are the ones who are the behavior of the organization. If you guys know about these seven signs, Talk to your executives about this, because at the end of the day, it's organizational agility we're talking about. It's not just about being agile. So let's talk about this. Disruption is everywhere. Can we agree that there's a little bit of hype around agile right now? Just a little bit? A little bit? Yeah, I can see some nodding heads. There is some hype around this. I'll be the first to say, I mean, hey, I wrote a book about it. So yeah, lots of hype. But there's a lot of reality here, too. I mean, the world is different. The world is changing. There's disruption everywhere. I mean, you look at companies who used to be completely comfortable suddenly being disrupted in a matter of months. This is, this is completely frightening to them. You see a certain politician with an orange hue make these crazy rules, and suddenly the trade markets get disrupted. I mean, this happens all the time. And then we have things like climate change. I mean, this picture here is from Iceland, and this was a natural phenomenon. But climate change, these kind of things are disrupting the way we work, the way we think. Where we work and how we work is changing dramatically. So this agile thing is, yes, hyped up, but it's also real. And believe me, our executives are thinking about this big time. They're wondering about this right now, because what's happening is they're seeing that there's no sustainable advantages anymore. What's starting to happen is, if you think about the Fortune 500, the average age of the company for the Fortune 500 back in the 1960s, when they started that index, was just about 60 years. 60 years old is what these companies were. If you go now to look at the average age of the company right now on the Fortune 500, it's creeping down around 15 years. So what's that telling you? Things are happening very fast, and they're not surviving. They're being disrupted quickly. Change is not optional. What's starting to happen now is that executives are understanding that they can't continue the way that they used to work. If you look at McKinsey, they did a study, and they found out that 93% of executives right now is looking at organizational agility as their top three priority. So you're going to hear a lot of talk about this. But the question is, how do you do it? Well. There's some ways that you can make this happen. And I, what I'm going to tell you about is the seven signs that tell you that you're on the right path. It's not going to be, OK, we figured this out. It's going to tell you, you know what? We might not have all the answers, but we're doing something right. There's certain behaviors that you can look at right now in your team, in your organization, to see whether or not you're becoming more agile. And if you don't see it, I encourage you to speak up. Say something. Because we cannot not change. Why do we do this? Well, as it happens, being more agile actually works. It actually has tangible benefits. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples from companies I work with. Here, for instance, have you guys heard of Here? It, it's a company based in Berlin. It used to be called Navtech before that. They do digital maps. And what they were doing was amazing. They transformed the organization and was able to respond to high-level defects 2.5 times faster than what they did before. Speed was paramount, and they did that. ING, huge financial company in Netherlands. Have you guys heard of ING? They're doing a major transformation right now. If you look at their customer retention, and if you look at what they're doing in terms of customer support, going up dramatically. 20% more customers are now continuing to engage with them because of what they're doing with Agile. This company, I don't know if you heard of these guys, Equinor. Nobody has heard of them. They used to be called Statoil. Huge, it's Scandinavia's biggest company. Uh, they they rebranded themselves because they're not into oil anymore. They're into energy. So Equinor is the new name. It's supposed to be, I think it's uh, Equality and Norway. So yeah, I'm not sure if I like the name, but they're doing some amazing things. The stat I'm going to give you now is going to blow your mind. So 
they were able to change the way they work to the point where in the next two years, they're projected to have the same profits as they did in the previous 17 years combined. Can you imagine that? In just the next two years, it's amazing. They totally changed the way they work because they had urgency. They saw what happened to the stock, to the oil price, went from $120 a barrel to 20. That'll get your attention. So they started changing the way they work, and now they're profitable at $20 a barrel. And the oil price now being around 70, well, you see the profits come out of it. Nokia. I'm assuming you guys have heard of these guys. I have a lot of faith and a lot of love for Nokia. I used to work there for many years. I'm sure we had a phone there. You know what? I think of them as an agile company. I'll tell you more about that later on. But the thing is, they were able to increase their, their, their employee retention rate by almost 20%. And that is not easy when you are a brand that sort of your dad works for. I mean, Google, Facebook, you guys get all the cool employees. Nokia was able to keep their employee retention rates really high because they were more agile. So it's working, but it's so damn hard. That's the problem. This is really, really hard. If you look around, if you read up on this, you'll see there's so many failure cases of this not working. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The top three things is what I'll tell you about now. And then later on, I'll tell you about the science you can look for. The first one, lack of executive support. If you don't have executive support, it's going to be really hard to be agile. The reason for that is that this is a transformation that affects all parts of the organization. This is not just one thing that just the UX people do, or the marketing people do, or the developer people do. Everyone is affected by this. So if you don't have executive support, it's going to be really hard. So you need that sense of urgency. Second thing, believing we're done. I can't tell you how many times I work with clients, we great some re really good wins. OK, we're starting to, we see speed going up, we see quality going up. And suddenly they say, all right, we're agile. That was pretty easy. Took 18 months, we got some consultants, but we're agile. Mission accomplished. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Agile is about continuous improvement. It's about continuously improving the way you work, being more agile today than you were yesterday. That's the essence of agility. Failure to show meaningful progress. This one is so important because agile is not something you do because it's cool. You don't do it because the competition does it. You do it because you're solving a problem. Agility works great in certain environments. Doesn't always work great in other environments. And we'll talk about what those environments are. But the point being, show how you're making progress. Validate your hypothesis that agility is helping you. If you don't do that, if you don't track the why, and whether or not you're meeting the why, you're going to lose support very quickly, and momentum goes down. So those are the three reasons why it fails. Many other reasons for it, but these are the top three I've seen. But what I'm going to do now is try to be positive. Because I'm thinking, well, we can just get really depressed and talk about the reasons it fails. I was thinking, what are we? Hey, we're in Dublin, right? It's the, the land of thousand smiles or something like that. Was it pints? It, it's one of those. So I thought, instead, why don't we talk about some of the signs that actually tell you that you're on the right path? So that you can look at this and say, all right, we know what we're doing here. We're going to increase those conversions, but we know that we need an environment of agility to make that work. What are some of those signs that tell us that we're on the right path? So I'll tell you about those. And if you don't see them in the organization, speak up. First one, and I always ask exec executives this, would you rather be right or successful? Because you can't always be both. Very often, you may have to choose. And the other side of this is, are you allowed to be wrong? I work with executives that will not necessarily care about being successful. They want to be right. That's what their bonuses are tied to. I want to give you two examples. I worked for both of these people. Stephen Elop over here, not sure if you knew, know this guy, Canadian, very articulate person. He was the CEO of Nokia for some time, and I worked directly with him. And we were very agile. And people will tell me, OK, Jorgen, if they're so agile, why did Nokia go under when it comes to their, their mobile phones? Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. As we were working with Steven, we saw that our quality went up, our speed went up, but we also saw that users weren't buying the phones. And the reason they weren't buying the phones is because we didn't have the ecosystem around it. Symbian was where we were. He moved over to Windows Phone. Well, as it happens, Windows Phone doesn't have an ecosystem of apps like Android and iOS. 
He kept pushing forward. Data kept coming back saying, this is not working. Our customers are not connecting. He kept going anyway. His, he wanted to be right. He didn't care. Contrast this with Donna. Donna Potts McKinsey, head of HR at Navtech. We were going agile. And as you're going agile, understanding this is a full company transformation, she's heading HR. And she's telling me, Jorgen, this is really confusing to me. We, I understand we're going agile. I understand we're going to be faster. I understand all those things. But I'm not sure if our current HR tree works with that. I don't think we have the roles for this. I don't think we know how to reward people in an agile way. How do we do this? I am very confused. And now I'm supposed to stand here in front of 200 people and tell them how we're going to go agile. How do you expect me to do that? I tell her, be honest. Tell her that you don't know. Tell them that. But be honest and tell them that you're trying to make this happen and that you will learn along the way. And that's exactly what she did. She was so honest standing in front of them saying, I am totally with you on this journey. We're going to do this together. But I don't have all the answers. I'm not right right now. But I will get there. And this is the journey we're together on. And I made all the difference. It was an inflection point that suddenly made people sitting in the, in the room saying, that's how I feel too. I don't know how it is to be a developer who has to test at the same time, or being a UX person working with all these developer people. I don't know how that works. But figure it out. You want to be successful, not always right. And that means you've got to be wrong a couple of times. I think the previous speakers talked about that earlier, and I think that's a really good point. Number two, distributing responsibility. Uh, another word for this or phrase, skin in the game. Make sure that there's skin in the game across the entire value stream. I work with a guy, and this is, this is just kind of a sad story in a sense. He understands what's going on. We talked about transformation. We talked about the changes that need to happen. And he's telling me, you know, this is really difficult for me. I'm like, OK, I, I understand. It's, it's hard for all of us, but what do you mean? Well, you're telling me, I, I work for this sector. I lead this sector. And I see that my colleague over here has another sector that's more important to the company overall. We will be more agile if I moved some of my people over there. But at the same point, if I do that, I will not meet the goals of my annual bonus, and I will lose 25% of my salary. So in a sense, you're telling me, for us to be more agile as a company, I'm going to have to take a 25% haircut. And that's a pretty big ask. And you know what? I understand him. I mean, we, we want to be agile. We want to help our companies. But at the end of the day, we shouldn't be punished for that. We shouldn't hurt ourselves and our families by, by being caught in terms of money for that, right? So the idea being here, you have to use metrics. You have to use skin in the game type metrics. That means if one fail, all fails. We're in this together. Look at things like lead time across all the different portions of your organization rather than optimizing for local optimizations. Big, big thing you've got to think for. So look for that. This one is key. Aiming for good enough certainty. This is one of those I see all the time. Companies want to get everything right. They want to be perfect. And they end up spending a lot of time on analysis. Nothing gets done. This dude, probably seen him before, Jeff Bezos. I love this quote. Decisions should be made with about 70% of the information you wish you had. Wait for 90%. And you're too slow. Speed came up several times in Lena and Anna's talk, and Meta mentioned the same thing. It's about speed, it's about learning fast. If you wait until you have all the information, you're too slow. The cost of delay is too great. So make sure that you aim for good enough certainty, and about 70% is plenty of that. Look at that in your teams right now. Is that what you're seeing? How certain do you have to be before you can make a decision? Because that time that takes, it's very, very expensive. All right. Sign number three, four, sorry. Appreciating the importance of doing less work at once. Busyness. You heard about this? We're very busy. We're doing a lot of work. Work whip or work in progress, key lean term. Not going to get too technical with you, but it's really, really important. Two things here. This is called the Kingman, Kingman's curve. And what that essentially is telling you that the more things you work on at once, the slower you become at making anything done. So this is the utilization rate. As the utilization rate gets up to 85, 90%, it slows you down dramatically. 
kind of like your computers, right? You've probably been in the case where you have tons of these browser windows open, a couple of apps. You look at your CPU and your task manager, and it's looking about 95%. And what happens then? Nothing, right? It just, the computer just basically stops. That kind of happens to us, too, as an organization. If you do too many things at once, you're very busy, you do a lot of stuff, but you don't get to done. You don't actually finish anything. So that's a really key element. I use Steve Jobs here, not because he's necessarily a very agile guy. I think most of you probably heard his stories. He's not a warm and fussy kind of dude. But he got the whole idea of focus. What he would famously do is he would bring in his top 100 executives to an offsite and say, tell me the top 10 things we're going to work on for the next year. I want all of you to duke it out. I know you all have your, your particular horse in the race, but we're going to focus on the top 10 things. And they would go in there, they would duke it out, and they would shout, and they would scream, and they would do the macho thing, and oh, whatever it was, right? I'm going to win. And ultimately, they came down to about 10 things. And then he would say, all right, slash the bottom seven. We're doing these three. That's focus. And he did that because he knew that was actually gets things out the door. Think of this in your team. If you're doing too many things at once, think of this at, in your organization. Do you have a focus? Do you have real big bets that are actually big bets and not just Las Vegas kind of things? You just, ah, oh, they're all bets. Think about that. Very key, very key element. But the other side of that, limiting what you do, the other side is deciding what to work on. How do you prioritize those things? That can be really, really difficult. What you've got to think about here is a couple of things. Economic value, cost of delay. How long does it take you to make a decision, and how much does it cost you not to have something in production? That could be really, really expensive. Cost of delay is made by Don Reinert, and essentially is the impact of time to life cycle profits. Let me give you this slide. I have worked on several companies, and every time I do this, it looks kind of like this. Let me try to explain what this is. So what I have here on the horizontal axis is a project, and it's estimated cost of delay. So here's the actual cost of delay. And you'll probably notice that there's a certain shape that this curve has. What it's telling you is that 80% of the cost of delay is concentrated around 20% of the projects. But this company is doing all of these things at the same time. And what do you think happens here? What do you think these projects are competing for? They're competing for your time. They're competing for your resources. They're creating dependencies. They're creating bottlenecks. Should you really be working on this guy over here if this guy is being delayed? Understand the economic impact of your choices. Not only just, yes, understand you've got to limit the amount of work, but also understand why you limit it and what you should focus on. Cause the delay, if there's one metric you should come out of here from, remember that and talk to your executives about it. I like this one. Learning to let go of the illusion of control, because the idea is, we never had control in the first place. Organizations, they have this thing that they want to create, resilient organizations that never fail. That's a recipe for disaster. That makes you very, very fragile. Instead, focus on recovery. Focus on how long it takes you to recover from failure, rather than trying to prevent failure. In, in fact, embrace it. Maybe even institute it. This is what Netflix does. Have you guys heard of Chaos Monkey? A lot of your technical people have probably heard of that. So very simply explained, Chaos Monkey is essentially an initiative where they insert failure into the organization, into their systems, so that a part of the system will fail, and everyone needs to fix that system really quickly. And this happens in production. And they do this because what they want to do is make sure people are always alert, make sure they're always thinking of ways to more quickly recover, not to prevent failure, but actually try to recover faster. That's the key to agility. I like this one. Recognize that as a system, when it comes to the product here, we're talking about interactions, not the individual parts of the system. This can sound a little bit obtuse. I understand that. But I'm going to try to make it really real for you. Because I think you've probably seen this in your teams as well. When we talk about agile, when we talk about being more effective, where do we work? Very often, we work at the team level. You start optimizing the team. You start doing much better at the team level. 
and we forget about the interactions between the different parts. That's ultimately the product of our system. Look at this, this is from a real client that I work with. We did a value stream map, basically sort of outlining the work that happened from go to get from concept to execution. And you can see the different pieces here. I didn't talk about all of them, but a lot of had to do with product definition, design, leadership sign off, the agile, <laughs> this is the agile part, and then training and support like nobody cares about, and actually going live. Is, is this uncommon? This almost always happens, right? That's what they do. Like the agile efforts kind of structured right here where you see the green dots. But what happens over here? We don't actually see a customer. The customer doesn't really have any contact with us until week 41 or 42. It takes forever. And then we say we're agile. What we're doing is we're optimizing inside here, which is typically where agile sometimes starts. And we don't think about agility. We think about agile and not agility. We don't understand that to have agility, we've got to think of the whole organization. So how do you solve that? Well, you restructure this a little bit, and you actually think more fast-fail kind of experiments, and you think about small slices at the time. Think about ways that you can much quicker optimize for the customer. How can we, at the fastest amount of time, get to the customer? And this is how you do that. You start having people work together, collaborate. Here we're talking, you know, the vision, the strategy, alignment, refinement, all of these things are now happening much faster at much smaller pieces of work where batch sizes now are very small. And the goal here is to learn fast, to reach the customer quickly, and to say, are we on the right track? Is this working? A-B testing is a great example of that. How quickly can we get to that? Now what happens if you do that, you have multiple validations of the customer. You can look at the customer and see continuously, are we still on the right track? Are we doing the right thing? That's how you do that. Most organizations don't understand that this is about agility. They only focus on the, the agile part, which is, which is much smaller. So those are the seven points. And of course, you can see all this in the slides. But what does this mean? What this means is that this is a holistic transformation. We talked about executive support earlier. It's because it affects all parts of your organization. Technology, that's kind of what we've been talking mostly about today. You know, the methods, the tools, you know, the techniques. That is definitely one of those items. You're probably not going to be very agile if you don't change your tool set. You know, the cloud, I mean, it's going to completely change the way you work. So that's very, very important. But that's not all. You have to combine that with the other parts of the organization. The organizational design. How are we structured? Are we siloed, where we have all sorts of dependencies between us? Do we have all sorts of political wars going on? How do we optimize for the customer from an organizational design perspective? How do we make sure that we can work together, where we can collaborate, where we can focus and collaborate quickly? It's not just open space. Not so simple as that. But that has to be taken into account. People. None of this gets done without people, right? What kind of people do we bring in? How do we reward our people? How do we keep having them learn new things? How can they develop their skill sets? How do we create craftsmanship, pride in their work? I think Anna talked about that earlier. That's, that's part of this. Leadership, a really important role. The language leadership uses. I love what Brian was saying earlier about the fail wall. What do you think the fail wall says when leadership puts up a fail wall? That says a lot, right? It says, hey, it's OK. We don't have to get it right all the time. Leadership is extremely important here. And all of this, of course, is tied down to the culture. It's the whole idea of a continuous improvement mindset. It's the whole idea that we are continuously learning and that we don't have all the answers. And we're actually OK with that. We plan to replan. We embrace change and execute with purpose. Those things stand together. The culture of the organization. How do you change the culture? You change it by changing the behaviors. How do you change the behaviors? You change the behaviors by changing the incentive structures. If you don't have incentive structures that create agile behaviors, you're not going to have an agile culture. This is why the entire organization has to be online. If there's anyone here from HR, well, if there is, I would be very surprised and impressed. But talk to them. Embrace them. Come, come into this conversation, because we need them. Same thing with finance. If finance is setting you into 18-month rolling decks, 
you know, it's going to be very hard to be very agile. So think about that. Three things I want to leave you with. Unlocking agility at the enterprise level is a huge investment. I don't want to try to tell you that this is cheap, because it's not cheap. It's a transformation. So understand why you're making the change. Understand the problem you're trying to solve. Don't do agile just because it's cool or because what's people doing. Think about the environment you're in. Now, what's really cool is that based on the talks I saw earlier, most of you are in environments with lots of uncertainty, with, with lots of variability, where you don't have all the answers. Agile thrives in that environment. Agile doesn't do so well if you're in environments where things are sort of set. You know the customer. You know what the customer wants. The, 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 the decision is already made. Agile adds a lot of overhead. And it might not be the thing for you. But what's starting to happen is, dramatically, that is less the case. The consumer changes his or her mind frequently. I think we saw some stats for that earlier. Agile really works well there. So understand why you should do this. And then make sure that don't just say everything agile is great and everything great is agile. It's not very meaningful. Make sure that your operational strategy messes and actually aligns with your business strategy. Think about, think about a company like Ryanair. Ryanair is a company that f optimizes for cost. Can we agree with that? You know, if you go, if you go to any flights with Ryanair, I don't know how many of you have done this. I've done a couple. It's not necessarily the best customer experience. You're sort of put together with the chickens and the sheep, and you just sit there and you sort of go through and you say, OK, I'm paying 20 bucks for this, so it's OK. <laughs> they optimize for cost. And why they do that is like they know that people are willing to give up a lot of other things for that. You have an inconvenient hub. You don't have the best customer service. All those things are part of the package. But if you're a luxury hotel, and I don't sure if one of you have, have you been to Oberoi in India? Any of you? Nobody's even heard of Oberoi. If you ever do, oh yeah, you've been, so you know what I'm going to talk about now. If you ever go to Oberoi in India, it's an amazing hotel. You walk in there, and then five people will sort of basically descend on you and say, oh, what can I do to help you? Can I take your shirt? Can I give you a cup of tea? Can I do this? Can I polish your shoes? All of this happens at the same time. Do you think that they're optimizing for cost? No, they're not. They're optimizing for a customer experience, for pampering the customer. They're not very efficient, but they do that really, really well. So their operational strategy is matching their business strategy. right? Cost is not the point there. So make sure you understand what your business strategy is and match it, not the other way around. The way you work should support why you work. Agile is not something you become. This is the last part of it. It's, it's something you become more of. Agile is a continuous improvement journey. That's why you should be aware of consultants. And I'm one of them. When they come and they descend on your company and they try to sell you a solution, be very, very careful. Yes, they can insert some knowledge. They can inject some energy. But own your transformation yourself and understand that the way your Agile journey is is different from other companies. Don't just take the Spotify model, and blindly copy that. If you talk to Spotify right now, they'll tell you that the Spotify model was awesome in 2012. It is not the Spotify model anymore. You talk to people that work there now, they say, well, we don't work that way anymore. That would not be very agile, would it? No, I guess you got a point. The point is you change along the way. And the what you are today is going to be different from tomorrow because you continuously change the way you work. So. Lots of resources for you. I think these are all books. You don't have to read all of them. But I really encourage you to look at some of these. There's some really awesome ones. If you go to the Agile Alliance, uh, we had a balloon table. I've never seen those before. It's a, it's a table with a balloon. If you go there, you will see these resources. We have a little sheet you could take with you. Thank you so much.